and thank you very much for your time. And uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we are able to see it. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So I can start my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. So I'm, I'm going to give a talk uh, uh, now on, on machine learning and actual science and, and insurance. So I will just start by introducing myself uh, very briefly, just like Yuri did. And then we're going to move to the, um, the topic of today, which is this uh, uh, connections between machine learning and actual science. So uh, just to briefly introduce myself. So I'm Arthur Charpentier. I'm a professor in, in Montreal in Quebec. Um, I, I, I used to work as an, uh, in an insurance company a long time ago. Uh, I've been teaching actuarial science for, for, for years. Uh, I just mentioned a couple of books, so two of them are more on the mathematics of insurance, on predictive modeling. Uh, one of them is more on, on computational actuarial science. So I've been working on those topics for, for years. Um, you can find some, some codes and stuff on my uh, 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 GitHub uh, uh, repo. Uh, and you can also check on my um, on my blog. So usually I post a lot of things on my blog. Usually it's more uh, uh, updated than my papers. So papers take time. It's uh, always more uh, standardized. Uh, on my blog, I can share ideas, and and it's basically what I'm going to do today: share ideas with you about about this uh, topic of of predictive modeling. Uh, machine learning uh, in the context of insurance. If you want to, lo to look at the slides, uh, uh, they are available on the blog. Uh, you can use the QR code if you want to, to go di directly to the, the slides. There will be a lot of references at the end of the slide, so uh, uh, I'm going to skip them today, but if you want to, to look at more details, you can look at the references in the slides. So uh, we're going to talk about insurance. So insurance, I guess all of you know what insurance is about because most of you, or I guess all of you have in, an insurance. So the, the idea of insurance is, I, I'm using a very old quote. I don't know where it comes from. I've been told it was by the Lloyds, uh, um, maybe 100, 120 years ago, but I couldn't find any proper reference for that. But basically the, the idea is insurance is the contribution of the many to the misfortune of the few. So you got a population, uh, a set of people, uh, uh, and, and they, they, ha they have some risk. All of them have, have individual risk and they don't want to, to face uh, uh, possible losses. So basically they, they contribute. And if some of them get a loss, then they will get some, 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 some money back uh, to cover for the losses. So, so, so insurance is about contracts where we have policyholders, we have insurance companies. The idea is that insurance companies will ask for a premium. So pr premium is paid initially. So policyholder pay a, a fixed premium and in exchange for that premium, they will get a, a compensation in the case they have a loss. And the idea is, is first losses are random. So some, most of the people will not get any loss. And the second thing, which is probably the most important one, is that you set the premium at the beginning. So it's really a, a, a prior ideas that insurance company got about the risk of the policyholders. And they cannot change it. So once you sign the contract for one year, so most of the contracts I'm going to talk about are one year contract. Everything that will happen during this one year will be covered by the insurance company, whatever the premium was. So if they misprice it, it's their problem. Okay. So we have to keep in mind this design and this is what is going to, 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 to be extremely important in, 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 in insurance, which is the idea of having a predictive model. When you want to find the, 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 this idea of, of premium, you need to understand predictive modeling. You, you need to forecast how many uh, losses the people might have uh, in the future, in the next year. So it's really about predictive modeling. So once you understand that insurance is about uh, uh, selling a, 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 prom a, a promise uh, uh, and, and a dream, like, okay, if you give me some money right now, I'm going to give it back to you in case you have a loss. Okay, so it's a promise insurance company are, are selling to the policyholders. Um, you see that we need predictive models and, 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 and they will be the heart and the core of, of, of the insurance business. So we need good predictive models and this is why there's such an interest uh, for machine learning techniques in insurance. Um, I'm going to talk about related uh, stuff because it's not only about pricing, okay, there's a lot of things going on in insurance, but, but pricing is, is clearly a big issue in insurance. Um, 
Now we need to, to discuss what is this contribution? What, what should it be? Uh, uh, we're going to talk about statistics, but there's also a lot to do with, with economics because it has to be fair. So we're going to talk a little bit at the end about this idea of having a fair contribution. So we're going to talk about fairness from a, a statistical point of view, but also maybe from an economic and a, a philosophical uh, point of view. So there will be the actual fairness. Actual fairness means probably that you're going to pay, the premium should reflect what on average you expect to have as a loss. Okay, so you, we can see that there will be some interaction with the L2 norm. Um, there will be connections with the predicting and expected value. Okay, but we can change what, what we will use as a premium principle. Okay, but this will be basically the idea of, of, of fairness. Uh, if people have different risks, maybe the, 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 the expected premium should not be the same for everyone. So it should take into account some covariance, right? So if you have um, a very expensive car and you have a car insurance, then you should somehow take into account that the fact that the car may be faster, uh, may, may be more expensive and stuff like that. So the premium, it should be fair to ask for a, a, a higher premium for very expensive cars. Okay, so this is the idea of fairness. But we can think also about this idea of, 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 of uh, prevention. Uh, if there's nothing you can do about it, is it fair to ask for a higher premium? And this was a debate in Europe for years. Should you ask uh, a higher premium for female? Because for some reason you can observe that statistically uh, the, expected the, the, the expected losses is higher uh, or not. And this is the idea of fairness in, in a more, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it causal, but it's, it's the idea of, it's not really causality. It's more the fact that some variants, people cannot change them. And it might not be fair to ask them for a higher premium uh, just because of, of some features uh, they cannot change. So uh, there is this idea of change, choice, choice uh, sensitive fairness that we're going to discuss at the end. It's coming, we can see that a lot in, in machine learning and algorithmic pricing. Uh, it was, somehow uh, are already there in actual uh, and econometric models, but now it's, it's very, very important, may, mainly because of regulation. So we're going to talk about this idea of, of, of discussing this, uh, this problem of uh, trying to get a, a good estimate of this uh, fair contribution uh, uh, as a premium, right? So basically the idea, the agenda for today will be first a discussion about those predictive models. Uh, in a very general context, I'm going to show you other uh, applications than pricing. Then we're going to get back on pricing and I'm going to discuss a lot of things, including goodness of it. So it will be an, an important issue. Then we're going to talk about interpretation because that's also a, a very a key issue, especially in Europe because of the regulation. When, when you use, a, 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 I would call that a machine learning technique, you have, to be explained to, you have to be able to explain to the policy holder why he's, he's having such a premium. So if it's coming from a black box, you, 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 you cannot use that in, in Europe. So you need interpretation of the models. And then we're going to discuss about fairness and, and discrimination, and then I'm going to conclude. So just to um, give you first a, a, a broad idea of, about, about those predictive modelings, I'm going to discuss where we have those machine learning stuff uh, 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 in insurance. Um, I'm going to talk about algorithm, about techniques, about predictive modelling, but also about data because uh, it's not only a change in the way we estimate things, it's not about uh, switching from econometrics to machine learning, it's also about the data we're using. So historically we've been using data as a very simple data set, a matrix. Uh, um, but now we have more and more complicated data and in some cases it's not possible to use uh, 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 a logistic regression point. So when you use pictures, neural networks are, are much more better than, than uh, uh, logistic regression. So um, this, the, this is the kind of stuff I'm going to talk about right now. So uh, one, one example is the first one. So it's about fraud detection. So fraud has always been a, a, an important issue in, in insurance. We can relate that to fairness because if you allow people to cheat, then it has an impact on people who don't cheat. So uh, just because we need some sort of balance between for the insurance company between what comes in and what goes out. Okay, so you have to get a fair premium that should reflect what you pay. So if you pay uh, for losses that didn't occur, it's not fair for those who, who didn't cheat. So uh, it's very important to detect uh, 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 fraud. And I mentioned a, a recent article that was published, uh, re oh, sorry, it's not published yet, 
uh, it's still a, a working paper, but um, well, they start to use networks uh, uh, to see possible connections because it's what has been observed on fraud. So basically you have uh, clusters of people chilling uh, on a network. So using networks is something that can be extremely interesting. So here, I, I just want to a graph on the right where you have connections between uh, not only well, policy holders, but not because they are connected like their friends on Facebook, maybe because they go to the same garage, because they use the same kind of, of broker or whatever. So we're trying to make all possible connections between people and see if there's something wrong uh, uh, that we can see in the network. So this is something that is coming, becoming popular in, in insurance. Uh, something else is the idea of, of using pictures. So I put some uh, on the right on the bottom. It's it, the use of satellite pictures. Uh, it's popular in agriculture. Um, because in some cases you want a parametric model. So you don't want to send an expert to see what's going on in the field, try to see uh, and spend a lot of time uh, checking if someone is claiming a loss. You can use satellite pictures to see what's going on. Uh, were there really a problem in the field and stuff like that? So insurers are also using drones to get pictures. And, and here it's more about, uh, uh, it's a project we're working on, on uh, using uh, satellite pictures for uh, flood events. So we got pictures before uh, the flood and then we have the water and we can clearly see water and we want to assess how many people might, have, might, might claim a loss. We just want to get a quick idea of, of who's going to claim a loss. And there's also the idea of parametric insurance. Parametric insurance is the idea that usually on my pictures previously I was telling you about the loss. So there should be a loss. So loss is something that the, insur the, the insurer is experiencing. So you have a loss. And then you're going to, to, to claim it to the insurance company. And then they're going to see if there was a loss, send an expert, try to find the, the, the amount of money they, they will give you back and stuff like that. But in some cases, insurance company want to use something very, very quick, like a, a parametric model. It's what companies now are using for in some cases, like in, in, in agriculture. You're going to use not the uh, actual losses. You're going to use maybe uh, meteorological data. So if you see that there was no, no rain for two months in one specific field, then you can for sure send some money to the uh, agriculture because uh, it's losing some money because there was no crop on this field. So it's the idea of using satellite pictures, but uh, we want that to be automatic. Okay, so it's, 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 it's quite now standard and, and there's a lot of, of stuff going on, on on satellite pictures and machine learning. Um, Maybe I will talk first about this, the last one. The last one is about automatic reading. So the fact that in many cases, uh, insurance company gets, uh, um, um, in some cases it's, it's, it's standard forms. So here you have medical forms that were filled by people. So at least you know where should you, you should look for to get some data. The problem is, is that in some cases it's handwriting. So it's very difficult to, to see what's going on. And I was involved in some project with some insurance company where they wanted to, to, to get some quick assessment about medical reports. So sometimes someone comes and says, I want to get some, some, some medical insurance from you. And they come with a big file. And you're like, okay, I have to, to read it quickly. Uh, am, I, am I going to waste, I don't know, one or two days of, of a doctor's uh, uh, day to, to read the report and, and say something? Or can we get something automatic? Okay, so it's about not reading into details, but checking quickly what's going on in these reports. So it's about reading uh, hundreds of pages, looking at pictures of, of x-rays and stuff like that, and, and say something from, from a big file of reports. So it can be very automatic, but of course we know there will be mistakes. But uh, uh, on the other hand, you, you spend the, the time of doctors just to read reports and say something. So maybe doctors can do something else than reading reports. So it is something that is, is becoming more and more popular. I will talk a little bit about claims reserving because it's also an issue. So I talk about the premium. Premium is the first step. Usually it's, 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 it's from the underwriting side. So first you get the client, you ask for a premium, but then once you have a loss, it's not that simple. I'm going to claim that it's very simple that you get the amount of money and you pay for it. But in real life, it's more complicated because it can take month, it can take years, even decades. Okay, if you, take, if you think of, of hospitals uh, insurance, it, it can take years, even decades to, 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 to settle a, a claim. So it can be extremely long. I'm working also on, on bodily injury. So when you have a car that hit a pedestrian, 
uh, it can be very complicated. The guy is going to spend uh, months or years in hospitals. It's very expensive and it's very, very difficult to assess the exact amount of money of that loss. So claims reserving is the idea that uh, the insurance company has to settle a reserve for future losses and future payments. Okay. So in some cases you don't have, uh, uh, I mean, when, when, you, when, when you're working on the accounting side, at the end of the year, when you close the book, you're supposed to have some money from losses that occurred that were not even reported. Okay. So in some cases you get losses uh, 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 weeks, months, even years after, especially uh, again on hospitals. Uh, if a surgery went bad, it might take years to know that it went bad, but you need the money in the, in, in, in the company uh, for those losses. And claims reserving is complex and you need to take into account a lot of information like is this claim going to go to trial? Should we pay a lawyer? Uh, how much will it cost? And stuff like that. So it's very difficult to assess the stuff. And, and, and some people are trying to use machine learning techniques on those specific problems, right? So this is what we have. And, and insurance is, it has to do with a lot of things. It has to do with climate. It has to do with agriculture, with, with health. Um, and, and it's connected to a lot of, of, of other stuff in, in economics. I mentioned uh, also some books by Michel Denuit, uh, Julien Truffin, and Donat Sieno uh, in Belgium, who published three books on, on machine learning for actuarial models. Uh, well, they provide a list uh, of all possible models you can use with examples. But now I'm going to talk about uh, one important thing, which is this idea of premium. Okay, so we want to compute the premium. So my, again, my premium is my contribution. How much should I pay as a policyholder to the insurance company to get my cover? So most of the time we're going to use the expected value of the losses. So it's something that has been used for, for possibly 200 years. Okay, so it's, uh, as, as people say in probability, um, the expected value is the fair value of a, of a gain. Okay, so using the expected value is a fair price. Okay, so you can move to economics and say, we need to take into account the utility of people and stuff like that. But here we just talk about technical premium. So if someone didn't have any uh, 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 risk aversion or stuff like that, which amount of money should we ask uh, 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 this policyholder to pay to get this cover? Okay, so we got the expected value that will be used as, as, as a fair way of computing premium. Then we need to look at the random variable. So my random variable is my losses. So S is my, my random variable. So as we can see, and this is where it starts to be a little bit complicated in insurance, uh, as I told you, when you have a, a, a policy, it's usually a one-year contract. So you are fully covered for one year, right? And on this year, if you take car insurance, you can have zero claim. For more, most of the client will get zero claim. Some of them will get one. Some might get two, three, four, five. I mean, I got an asset with someone who got like 37 claims on one year. Okay. Once you, when you sign a contract as an insurance company, you're stuck with this client. So you, you'd better get a fair premium for that one. Okay. So we have this number of losses, number of claims that is a random variable. Okay. So the first problem is, will we have a loss or not? And if we have, how many will we have? Well, that's the first problem of randomness. The second one is the amount of money. For each, of, for each claim, we don't know the amount of the claim. Okay. Of course, if you have a big one at the beginning for your car insurance, the car will be destroyed and basically you just end the, the insurance and, be, and you will have only one big claim and that's it. I've been working also on caravans. Usually you have uh, uh, one or zero claim uh, uh, per year because basically you just take your, your caravan in the summer. If you've got a problem, your, your, your holidays are, are just uh, uh, going to trash and you don't take any more holidays for one year. So basically you got one claim and you got zero. Okay, so it's a very classic, simple case, but in, 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 in more general cases like uh, health insurance or car insurance, you don't know how many claims you will get on one year. So we got two sources of randomness and they don't deal with the same kind of, of, of viable. One of them is about counting, one of them is about losses. Okay, so we have this S viable, which is a compound sum of, of, of random losses. And this is where it can be a little bit tricky for, for people not really familiar with, with insurance. When you come from econometrics, you cannot use a, a classical OLS technique because it cannot be considered as Gaussian. Okay, it's not a Gaussian random variable. Uh, you have a huge concentration of zeros 
and then you have a, a, a distribution with, with, with possibly a density. Okay, so it's, it's um, a, a mixture of zeros and a variable with, 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 with a density. And then we have the idea of covariance. Uh, if we think in terms of fairness, we should not ask the same premium to everyone. People should have different contribution based on their risk factor. If you think in terms of, of <clears throat> I don't know, pension, uh, it should depend on your age, right? So if you, or, or, or death insurance. Um, uh, uh, if you want to get a cover against uh, a, a, a death of someone, uh, clearly it will depend on the, on the age of that person. <clears throat> okay, so features can be a lot of things. And then the fair premium will be the expected value of as given the covariance, right? So this is basically what we want to compute. We want to get the expected value of as given x. Uh, what we usually do in, 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 in actual science is to say, okay, if we assume that the frequency and the amount of money are, are independent, then we can prove that actually this expected value can be the product of two. One of them will be uh, the frequency. How many claims do you expect to have? What is your claims frequency? And then once you have a claim, what is the expected loss? Okay, so if you have a small car or if you have a big car, the expected loss is not the same for material insurance or material uh, uh, damages. Okay, so we have the first formula, which is frequency times average cost. The second one can be slightly different and it's what people use more when they use machine learning technique. The first one is, will we have a loss? So it's basically a zero one variable. And if we have a loss, then we focus on the amount of loss no matter the number of claims that actually happen. And this is cool because actually when you use something like that, you have something very simple, a zero one problem, which is very basic in machine learning. It's a classification problem. And then you have a positive random variable. But basically, if you use a logarithmic transformation, you can use any kind of L2 norm on this uh, distribution. And this is more popular in, in machine learning. So we have two different approaches that can be used in, 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 in modeling. Uh, losses in insurance. Now just to just to present more, 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 more precisely what we're doing, I'm going to show you two classical data sets we have in, 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 in machine learning. This is the first one, it's the policy one. Okay, so we got NP people in the data set, so we will have NP rows. Okay, so we have different people, we have the IDs, which will be the, the contract number, then we know where they live, we have some information about the car, the age of the car, uh, the age of the driver, the model of the car. So we can see that some variables will be continuous, some of them will be categories. Uh, we have a lot of things. Uh, one of them is tricky one, is the exposure. And it's something that um, we have to deal with because in some, in, in, in some portfolios, we got people that were with us for two years, some of them with, uh, were with us for three months or stuff like that. So, um, the exposure is something extremely important. If so, if you observe someone for only six months, it's not the same as observing that, per, that, that person for three years. You expect more losses for three years than uh, six months. Okay, the good thing is if you have a probabilistic model, you can think, oh, Poisson is very popular for, for, for accidents. And hopefully we got the Poisson process. Poisson process is basically if you stay for a very long period of time, the number of claims you're going to, to observe is proportional to this person, to this, to this duration. Okay, so basically we can end up with this nice probabilistic model, which is the number of claims you, you, you expect to observe should be a Poisson variable um, proportional to the exposure, and then you have the, 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 uh, the exponential of a linear transformation. So this is basic GLMs. And I think actually there's a lot of econometric techniques because econometrics strongly relies on probabilistic model. Insurance has to do with probabilities because we deal with uncertainty and stuff like that. So insurers love probability models. So if you have a probability model, it's very good and, and you can use that. So if this is why uh, actuaries are using a lot of econometrics. It's, it's it, because we have the same culture in econometrics and actuarial science, okay? As we will see, machine learning is, is very different. It's not based on, 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 on probability. In machine learning, you don't assume a distribution for your losses or whatever. You, you focus on the loss function. Of course, you can derive a loss function from the, from the likelihood. But in some cases, you just pick a, a, a loss function and minimize some problem. We, you completely forgot about the, 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 the underlying uh, um, stochastic process. Okay? So actuaries have been doing this kind of, of, of Poisson process for, for, for 
almost 60 years and, and, and it's very, very popular uh, in, 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 in insurance. If you focus on the losses, so losses is different. You have a different data set, which is the data set with the claims. Okay, so NC is my number of claims. So I got NC claims, okay? But I can link it to my previous underwriting data set because we have the policy, the policy number, okay? So we can add some more information in the data set based on the, on the covariates we have. And then we can do the same. We can run some regression model on the cost, okay? We can get the cost per cover, okay? So we can have third party, we got material, okay? We got theft, we got fire, we got whatever uh, cover you want. So you can do something uh, on multiple cover, you can focus on one cover. So this is what actuaries are doing, okay? So trying to do some predictive models and, and, and this is what they use, okay? So one popular model is this, uh, say gamma loss, gamma, gamma model. So we assume that the cost is a gamma distribution, okay? So we have this gamma GLM, okay? And a good thing is actually we can mix it with something different. Like what happens if you've got a big claim? So you focus just on motor insurance and then you have someone who hit a pedestrian, uh, a young one who spent like five years in the hospital. The cost was like $3 million. The other ones are very classical ones. How do, how do, you, how do you deal with this $3 million? Do you expect all the people with the same features as that person to pay a huge premium because they had a big claim? Usually we try to exclude those very big claims. Just because, and it's related to this idea of fairness, most of the time it's just bad luck. Bad luck, bad luck has nothing to do with covariance. So the idea of bad luck is we can just spread it uh, among everyone. Just because everyone is as likely to hit a kid uh, 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 was crossing the street. Uh, maybe it's not true, but it will be. It, it will give you uh, usually a better uh, uh, estimate of the premium if you do so. So usually we are going to to use also the uh, the amount of the claim as a covariate. Okay, so we're going to use a, a gamma model uh, uh, for the regular or small losses, and then once you hit a threshold, if you have a huge claim, then you're going to split it among everyone. Okay. So it's something, so all those models are very flexible because we have some understanding of what's going on, okay? We have a model, a stochastic model, and we can use that and, and estimate, and, and there's no identification problem on this one. It's very simple to use. Uh, something which is also very popular is Twitty model. So Twitty is, is a, a, a standard uh, GLM, okay? It was introduced by, by Twitty. Uh, it's basically what you have a, a, a collective model. So when you have a compound sum, you can prove that actually it can be written as a, a Tweedy uh, distribution, which is a compound sum when you have a, a random number of losses, which is a, a Poisson and the amount of money a gamma distribution. And this is nice because we have a distribution which is uh, an exponential one, so you can use GLM. And since we can see, uh, uh, so basically what, what, what econometricians are doing, they will maximize the log likelihood. So it's very classical in, in econometrics. You, you write your likelihood, you maximize it, and then you end up with coefficients. And what people are doing now in machine learning is because they don't really care about this likelihood, because you, most of the time there's no underlying pro probabilistic model. <clears throat> they just take this expression of the likelihood and say, oh, this is going to be my loss function. And the problem is just to minimize a loss, right? So this is what, uh, what you can see in many, uh, uh, models like in, 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 in random forest, you can use a Tweedy loss function coming from this uh, uh, Tweedy model, which is coming from this exponential distribution. Okay, so we can see that there will be a lot of, of interactions between machine learning and, 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 and econometrics. The trick is, is when we use econometric techniques, we know what's going on. We understand what we're doing because we have this underlying probabilistic model. If you focus on, on uh, say, a, a machine learning problem, you just give your data, you just give, it a, 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 give a loss function and say, okay, optimize that and give me numbers. And I'm going to use that for a price. And <clears throat> we can see that it's not very, very um, interesting because at the end, we don't understand what's going on, okay? So this is basically how uh, actual pricing is working. Um, I can mention also the idea of penalties. So no actuaries are using penalties. I think they were using that before not per se in the optimization functions. So they were still maximizing the likelihood. It's just that basically at the end, they were using the AIC or BIC to make some uh, model selection. 
So now we have more and more lasso and reach coming in because, or elastic net, just because we want to, at the same time, get a good model and penalize for, for complexity. Okay, so it's also something that is now popular and, and it's, I still call that econometric techniques. Okay, so this is what we have. Now, um, can we say something about the goodness of fit uh, of those models and, and talk about uncertainty? And uncertainty is something extremely important and all the more in insurance actually. So people coming from machine learning, discovering insurance data are always very surprised because basically all their models are not very good. And on, on, I would say it's very good that they're not good because it means that insurance makes sense. Insurance is the idea of pulling risk together and asking for, for solidarity uh, among people. So I'm just going to illustrate with, with one simple case. So just assume that losses are fixed. So it's a fixed number. So I don't have randomness on my losses. So if I got a claim, it will be a 1000 claim. If I got a, a, but I don't know if I will get a claim. And then I'm going to also simplify on the, on the, on the frequency. It can be zero or one. Okay, so basically either I got no claim or I got one claim and it will be $1,000. Okay, that's a very classical problem. The good thing is we can challenge most of the technique with machine learning because machine learning has a lot to do with classification. Uh, neural networks and stuff like that, they were uh, are very, very efficient in the context of, of classification pictures and stuff like that. So most uh, machine learning techniques are, are designed for classification. So having a, a classification problem and just a classification problem is something very simple. The other thing is we have a, a nice uh, technique to see if it's working well. We got the rock curve. So the rock curve is the idea of plotting the false positive rate, uh, sorry, the, the true positive rate against the false positive rate. Okay, so looking at the rock curve gives you a good idea of how your model is performing. Okay, so we're going to look at rock curves in my classification problem. Now, I have this number of claims, so my n, uh, zero one, which is just a Bernoulli, okay? And it's driven by some uh, risk factor. So theta is my underlying risk factor. So everyone, you, me, and everyone has, has a risk factor, but we don't know what it is. What we have is a covariance, okay? So you got the underlying risk factor and you got something which should be a proxy of this, of this risk factor, but usually it's an imperfect uh, uh, proxy, okay? And we're going to see two things. The first thing is the correlation between the risk factor and the, the, the covariance, okay? If you use machine learning techniques, we can get a very strong correlation. So we can capture nonlinearities. If we got multiple covariates, we can even capture some uh, cross dependencies. So this will be one issue. The second one is about the distribution of the un underlying factor. So theta, so theta is my, my probability basically. Okay, so if everyone has a different underlying probability to get a claim and it will be different. And here I'm going to use more Bayesian techniques. So I'm going to assume that theta has a distribution. So we got the um, uh, uh, very homogeneous portfolio, which is the red curve. So in that case, I got some, I like 80% of the people have a probability between 15 and, sorry, 5% and 15%. Okay, on average, we got 10% of, of having 10% chance of having a, a claim and the probability for 90% of the people of the portfolio is between 5% and 50%. This will be the red curve. The blue curve will be where we have more dispersion. So people are much more heterogeneous on their underlying risk factor. Here we got a big difference between uh, 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 the people. So 90% will be between zero and 40%. Okay. So those are the, the, the two distribution we're going to look at. So we got the uncertainty on the underlying risk factor, and then we got the correlation between the risk factor and the covariance. So this is the kind of, of thing you can get with simulations. So I've been using, I can't remember which model it is. I think it's a classical logistic regression, but model data was, were, were generated with a, a logistic regression. Okay, and then I'm going to use a covariate that is correlated to my risk factor. Okay with different copulas. So I got the low correlation on the, on the left and the high correlation on the right. And what you can see is even if you can capture the underlying risk factor, when you have a, a very big correlation, I mean, when you have a big correlation, uh, uh, you, you're on the right. But basically if the dispersion is not big, the rock curve is not going very high. So you end up with an AUC, which is very small. So there's no way you can get a good model, even if 
your covariates are very correlated with the risk factor if the underlying risk factor is not um, very volatile. Okay, so if you have a very homogeneous portfolio, it's very difficult to get a good model. So basically, why are you doing a, a complex machine learning technique? Because you cannot get something better than what you have on the right, right? So it's kind of tricky for, for people coming from machine learning that used to have on pictures AUC of 97%. When you, when you focus on insurance, it's very difficult to say who's going to get a claim. And, and actually, it makes sense. When you think about it, the idea is not about predicting who's going to get a loss. I just want to get the good estimate of the probability to get a loss. Okay. I hope that someday I will not be able to predict who's going to get a loss because basically if I can predict you guy, uh, you got 97% chance to get a loss next year, there's no, there's no point of insurance. I mean, we, if we can predict everything. So this uncertainty on the, on, of this underlying factor is very, very important. Okay. Now, if we have more dispersion, so if the portfolio is very different, so if you have very good drivers and very bad drivers in your portfolio, yes, you can do something. Okay. So if you cannot capture properly uh, 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 with your covariates, the underlying risk factor, you end up with the left one, which gives you a, an AUC, which is decent, but not big. And it will be better when you look on the right, but it's not very big, okay? So this is more or less what I wanted to say. You have this idea of, of the uncertainty on this uh, underlying theta parameter. Now, if I look on the right, we can see the evolution of the AUC uh, uh, based on the correlation. So even when you have a huge correlation, you cannot get a very good model. Okay, so it's very good. I mean, I would, I would say it's very good for insurance. What it means is insurance is as, as a very beautiful future. Everyone was claiming five years ago, like machine learning will kill insurance because we're going to be predicting everything. But no, it's not correct. Uh, if you look at portfolios of insurers, there's no way that using a machine learning algorithm, you're going to predict who's going to get a loss. I'm going to show you some graphs very quickly because uh, uh, in classical model, we cannot use rock curves because it's not a zero one, because losses uh, can be random. Uh, there was a very interesting article by Jet Freeze uh, and colleagues uh, uh, a few years ago on using some types of Lorentz curve for predictive modeling. The idea is we're going to sort not, not the wealth of people, but their risk based on their premium. Okay, so we got more risky people on the left and less risky people on the right. So what we assume is that more risky people should have more losses, okay? So we're going to look at the proportion of losses uh, uh, as a function of the proportion of the insured, assuming that they were ranked based on the underlying risk, okay? And you might assume that the curve will be like, like in, in the rock curve in the upper corner, okay? So if you use the same premium for everyone, you will be on the diagonal, but if you are able to find high risk and good risk in your, in your portfolio, then your curve should move to the, to the left. And the thing is, there should be what, what is called a perfect pricing. Perfect pricing is when you can capture this theta, when you can capture the underlying risk factor. And there's no way that you can get above this one. If you can get something which is better than that, it means that you're cheating. Basically, you, you, you're using some exposed pricing, saying, okay, you got a big loss last year, so we're going to charge you more. And it's not possible, something you can do in insurance because insurance is about this idea of, of, of prior pricing of future losses, okay? So this is something that is going to save insurance, except if you start thinking about telematics. Telema telematics, I think, are challenging for the insurance companies, but if you think in terms of classical insurance products, you have to settle the premium at the beginning. And at this point, there's no way that you can know who's going to get a claim and how much the claim will be. This is why we cannot expect to get very good models, whatever the techniques you're going to use, okay? And this has a lot to do with classical or OLS results. I'm just going to mention some results, you know, about the uh, 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 variance decomposition. When you focus on the variance decomposition, you got the viability of the premium, okay? The viability of the expected losses, and then you got the expected value of the viability. And in, the, in that case, you can split it in two. You can split it on, on what you have based on the risk factor, which is basically uh, 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 the lowest variance you can get, which is in OLS techniques is the sigma. The sigma square is the lowest variance you can get. And then you have what we call the misfit. So misfit is, is, is the additional variance you get because your covariates cannot replicate your underlying risk factor. Okay, so we got three sources of uncertainty in, in, or viability 
in the, in the, in the, the losses. One of them is coming from the viability of the, the premium. One of them is coming from the underlying uh, uh, true viability that you cannot go below because it, the, 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 the true risk factor, which is coming from bad luck, I would say. And the other one is coming from risk factor and the fact that you misfit. So this is where machine learning has to do a lot. It's about trying to find the good decomposition or, or, or association of covariates to capture this underlying risk factor. But it's just going to focus on this part. Okay. Now, uh, so insurance is about models, but also about interpretability. And interpretability is a very important issue. Maybe I, I will go a bit fast on this one because uh, I'm running out of time, but it's something which is important. Machine learning are usually black boxes. You can use black boxes to flag uh, a fraud case. In that case, you're going to send an expert. You don't really know, want to know why you got a, a, a red flag on this particular claim. What you want to know is where you should send your experts to, to get better results. Uh, but in pricing, when you ask for a premium, it cannot come from a black box. You should be able to explain to the, the driver, I'm sorry, the premium is high, but it's because of your age and it's because of the type of, of car you're driving. Okay, and, and if you cannot say something like that, it's, there's no way we can, we can sell insurance. And there's a lot of, of discussions of, of interpretability and explicability of models. Um, maybe I will skip those slides. And, and, and if you have questions, I will go back on them. Um, the second issue is, is, is more related to what I was talking about, is about this idea of fairness. So it is also something which is now required by regulation, which is, okay, it's good to have those uh, models, but basically, there are some variables, not only you cannot use them, but the premium should not be correlated with this one, like the gender. So in many countries, especially in Europe, you cannot use the gender, okay? So this is one first step, so it's an easy one. You just don't use the gender in your pricing model. The second one is you have to make sure that you don't do any discrimination, meaning different things. Discrimination has to do with algorithmic fairness, and I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. Okay, so we have to discuss this issue. The second one is, uh, and I think it's correlated with this problem, is because the gender is not uh, is not something that's related to a choice of the of the insured. Driving a, a sports car is something that you decide. Okay, so if you want to drive a sports car. If the premium is more expensive, then somehow it's your problem. If you want a cheaper premium, change your car. But if they tell you, well, sorry, the premium is two times larger than what your wife says because men are more expensive than women, then it's kind of unfair, I would say. Okay, so this idea is, is, is very important. The, the third one, I will not talk here too much about that, but it's about social justice. So in some cases, people claim that actually it's good to have some basic cover that, that should not be related to uh, actual pricing. So it's the case for, 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 for catastrophic insurance in some countries in Europe. Um, it's the case in some countries for health insurance. Health insurance can just be based on a, a contribution of, of your salary, okay, in several countries. So it's not related necessarily to risk factors, okay? So it's a social choice. So we have a lot of connections between actual model and social choices we can make. And, and it's, it has to do a lot with economics and philosophy. Um, now to get back on my algorithmic uh, fairness uh, is the idea that some covariates, so you got a, a big set of covariates, some of them are uh, uh, directly uh, related to some uh, variable you cannot use, like the gender. Unfortunately, some of them will be very correlated with the gender, okay? So just assume that in a country, women uh, drive very small cars, men drive very big cars and you say, okay, I'm not going to use the gender, but basically you use uh, the type of car. Well, then you're doing some sort of discrimination, okay? So, I mean, I'm not a lawyer. I, I don't want to enter into too much detail about these issues, but it can be an issue in some, in some countries at least, okay? So there are different definitions of what um, 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 discrimination can be. So I just mentioned some of them. So one of them it will be just, you just take your, 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 so I'm just working here. Most of those techniques are developed in the context of classifiers. Okay. Like, uh, can you rent a house uh, or can you, can you, or can you go in a club or something like that? So it's a very simple zero one problem. Um, there, there were a lot of application on race and gender. Okay. Uh, here we have a more complex model where we have a lot of covariates. 
and 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 a problem which is more complex, which is a premium, okay, which can be related to different things like the frequency or, or, or the amount of, 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 of the losses. Okay, so we got S, which is the score, and P will be my, my prediction in my classification. So P will be 0, 1, and the score is my probability to get a 1, something like that. So uh, the, the anti-classification rule says basically, if you have different people with different X1, so X1 are my forbidden uh, variables, okay, for the same X2, uh, we should get the same prediction. So we should get one or zero, okay? So we, we can get different probabilities, but basically we should get the same prediction. So if we got the same prediction, it means uh, uh, that actually uh, this is something which is fair, okay? Because whatever X1, you're going to get the same prediction. Then we can have something which is more or some metric that is used in classification, like uh, the false positive rate. So what you want to say is your false positive rate does not depend on your class on, on your forbidden variables. So whatever x1, your, your false rate positive will always be the same, something like that. And then you have something which is more related on the prediction based on the score. So assuming that you have the same scores, uh, then you can change the gender and see what's going on your, on your on your probability. Okay. So people with the same score with different genders, do we end up with the same um, probabilities? Something like that. So those are techniques that came up recently from the machine learning literature, and I think actuaries and econometrician should should start to to see how to use them uh, uh, in, in in pricing. Okay. So I think I got five minutes left, so I'm going just to wrap up and and to maybe open new doors. So I think machine learning and econometrics have a lot to do with predictive modeling, and this is the core of insurance. Insurance has a lot to do with prediction. Just because of this uh, simple model I was telling you about at the beginning, everything starts with a contract with the insurance company and a policy holder. And the first thing is set the amount of premium. So you need to ask for a premium, which will be an expected value or, a, or, or something else, right? We have a lot of, of premium principles, but it should be based on, on, on what you expect to have based on some covariance. It's impossible to use black boxes, okay? So, so far, we use machine learning more as a benchmark uh, to challenge um, econometric models because we, we know how those econometric models work. We have those uh, parameters that enter into those models and we know exactly that we can get interpretation. Okay, if we got a positive sign, we know that it's going to get a positive impact on the prediction or on the cost and stuff like that. But um, we, we need something we can explain to clients. Uh, we need to integrate also transparency fairness and equity in, in the models. It's, it's a requirement and I think it's, it's something that insurers are, are willing to get. Um, the thing is actual science has a lot to do with statistics, with computational science and with, 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 with econometrics. But I think we, we need now to take more into account the idea of, of economics because when we think in terms of equity, in terms of fairness, we have to, take, to think in terms of, of moral hazard, of competition and stuff like that. Um, we have also to take into account the idea of telematics because insurers collect more and more data and they have to find a way to use that. I mean, uh, when we started, I, I can just mention a, a quick example. Um, when we started to get telematic data, uh, like uh, when do you drive? Do you, drink, do you drive during the, the day or the night? Uh, do, you, do you drive for short distances or big ones and stuff like that? When we put everything together uh, with classical covariates, um, we've been able to get rid of the gender. So when you look at claims frequency, gender is very important, especially for young drivers, okay? The thing is, when you get rid of, well, sorry, when you include this telematic data to make some predictive modeling, so it's not based on pricing, it's just to make to, to work on prediction. So if I was able to get, so it's an, an, there's an endogeneity an problem here, but if we can take into account the, um, uh, the, the style of driving of, of the, the person, you don't need the gender. Gender was just used as a proxy of some uh, uh, driving pattern that we could not observe in the classical forms insurers were using. And just to conclude, because it's something that I'm very interested in uh, right now, is the idea of competition. Because here I'm just focusing on, on the predictive models based on my data. The thing is, 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 if you think in terms of economics, insurance is not only about having a model based on my data, it's 
surviving in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a jungle where you have competitors that can have different prices because they've got different models and they've got different data. And for the past three years, we've been working on games and, and, and now we have uh, some theoretical models based on reinforcement learning, where we're trying to see uh, uh, companies not only learning from their data, but learning from competitors' prices. So a lot of insurers are also going on, on, on websites where you can get quotes from different insurers and they can see where they are compared to competitors. And then you can use information from your, your past, but also from, from competitors. And this is something that is also new uh, uh, in, in, in it's, it's new if you use econometric techniques, but also in machine learning. In machine learning, they have a, a strong experience in games in machine learning, uh, learning games, but um, it's something that should be designed in the context of insurance. So I'm going to end here. So if you got any questions, again, you get my email, you can tweet me if you got questions and you can check on my blog if you go on some more details. Thank you, Arthur. And then uh, uh, we have, if you look at the question and answers, we have three questions and also we have one question uh, in the chat section. And uh, yeah, we have like, okay. a bit short time, but I can, you can, would you, yeah. Okay, so uh, maybe I will start with the very first one, which was, uh, yeah, it's the first one. How many regressors do you put inside the gamma and the price on regressors? Well, it clearly depends on first, the, the data you have. Uh, a lot of insurers have been using, so they've, they've been buying some data. Like you can get some data, once you have the location, when you have the address of that person, you can get information about the type of roads you have around. You, if, you, if you focus on household insurance, you can get satellite pictures, you can see if that person as a pool or whatever, uh, what's around. So you can enrich a lot, a lot your data, especially on household insurance. Once you have the location, you can get a lot of stuff about robberies, about everything that goes on in your neighborhood. So what you put inside can be huge. So it, I mean, huge. I mean, uh, in term, for, for an econometrician, maybe for machine learning, it's, it's very teeny, but tiny, but it's in, from an econometrician, it's big. Like you can start with 100, 150 covariates, most of the time you want it to be simplified. So you, you're going to use lasso to, to, to get interesting features. Uh, and yes, we, we have to take into account interactions. I was talking about gender. So if you're allowed to use gender, gender crossed with age is something which is extremely important. Uh, young female drivers are very safe. Uh, young male drivers are very risky. Um, we have also the issue of, of families where they have kids, uh, usually uh, the woman uh, or the mother uh, around 45 or 50 usually has more claims, right? So it's basically because they give the kid to the, 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 the car to the kid uh, on Saturday evening uh, and then you will have more, more claims. So basically you have to take into account uh, interactions and yes, it becomes more and more complicated. So this is why challenging like with a random forest is good because in your GLM you just put variables, then you challenge it with a random forest. If you see a big difference, it means either you, fall, you, you, you missed uh, non-linearities or you missed interactions. Okay, so this is what I, I think actually is using more and more. Okay, and the second question, the competitive market, what the, the rule of heterogeneity in predictive models. Um, what we've, so again, I've been playing on games. You can find a lot of slides on, uh, on my blog, uh, no papers because we're still working on it. Uh, where we ask players, mainly interest, to work on the same data. And what we did observe is when they start to use very different models, they end up with very different prices. So if, we, if everyone is using a GLM, you got a lot of, I would say, correlation between the premiums. The thing is when someone arrives with a, a neural network, so with random forest, you can end up with very, very different prices. You have no consensus on who's a good risk and who's a bad risk which is very, very interesting from a theoretical point of view, but it's, uh, it's very tricky to handle. So I don't know, we're still working on that. There, there will be more, more, more things coming in fall uh, on my blog and we're working on a research paper that should be published very soon on that topic. So it's a very, very important uh, question. And the last one is, um, uh, so it's about the, um, the, the question of, of imposing the same prices based, uh, for, for, for male and female, like if you want to exclude male and female. The problem is it's not only male and female. The problem is, is 
those variables are very correlated with others, uh, especially the type of car. So it's very difficult to say, okay, I'm going to get rid of that one because basically you can capture the gender based on a lot of, of stuff. There was, I think there was a challenge uh, by Kaggle a few years ago based on data, telematic data from an insurance company. And you can predict the gender just by looking at the telematic data you got. So on the style and uh, driving style of, of that person. So it's not only about removing a variable. I think, I think it's more complex. It's, um, but, it, but it has to do a lot with the definition, of, the proper definition of, of what you call discrimination. So um, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's, 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 it's uh, an ongoing uh, literature on this idea of discrimination and fairness. Uh, but it's it's definitely a challenge for the next year. So this is why I wanted to mention that here. I don't have any uh, uh, beautiful result to give you like, okay, this is now the benchmark. It, there's, there's nothing done so far. So it's a very, very open question. So I'm going to end here. I didn't see anything in the chat, but I'm a bit lost on my slide, on my, on my screen. I don't know if... Yeah, I guess it's... Uh, yeah. Um, I'm not seeing it either. Uh, I think it's, yeah, you answer all questions, I guess, Arthur. Perfect. Thank you very much.